All right, it's January 28th, it's a Thursday. I feel like the week has zoomed by for, at least for me, I don't know about you, but it seemed like it just really just went by quickly. But today we're looking at Luke chapter nine, verses 28 to 36. We're looking at Luke 9, 28 to 36. And let me pray for us and then we'll get started. Lord, we just thank you for this time. And as always, Lord, may your word nourish us, um, lift us up, um, have a greater love and appreciation for you. And to you, always be the glory. Um, many things happen to us on a day-to-day -day basis. But may our hearts, may our eyes always be upon you. We thank you, Lord, and Jesus, I pray. Amen. All right, so we're looking at Matthew chapter 9, 28 to 36. And it says this, <laughs> Now about eight days after these sayings, he took with them Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered and his clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now. Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Now knowing what he said as he was saying these things, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen one, listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone, and they kept silent and told no one in those days anything of what they had seen. All right. So to start off, uh, we have to look at verse, verse 27. Because verse 27 is a very interesting passage or verse because if you just stop at verse 27, which was yesterday's passage, it kind of leaves it in a, like a mystery, like what's going on? What is it, what is Jesus trying to say in verse 27? And then when you move into 28 and 36, you realize that 28 to 36 is a, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It is the natural progression and development of verse 27. Now verse 27, it says this. So, well, up until then, verse 21 to, no, verse 18 to 25 or 26, what happened was that there's a revelation of who Jesus is. That he's not just some teacher, he's not just some prophet or a great leader, but that Peter confesses that he's the Christ of God. I mean, he's God. So there's a revelation that Jesus is God. He's not just some ordinary dude on the street that so happens to do miracles and, uh, and knows a lot of things about scripture. He is literally God in the form of a human being. So that, that's a huge, actually, turning point in the in the narrative that's a huge turning point in the gospel where we see that the true identity of christ is declared um, as a reader as a listener you already know but for people who are living in that time remember i don't i know this may seem like a dull moment but this is actually happening in real time that people experience this so up until then no one really knew who jesus was per se but out of this revelation given by the father Peter makes a confession that, you know what, Jesus, you're God. So as he goes there, that revelation happens. In verse 27, it says, But I tell you truly, Jesus is talking, talking to the disciples, But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Now, what does that mean? Some people have interpreted, oh, there's some people who will be immortal until the second coming of Christ. But that's, I, I don't think that's it. Because when you take that phrase, you will never taste death until they see the kingdom of God. What they're saying is they won't die until they see the fullness of the kingdom. Or not say the fullness, but they see the glory of the kingdom of God. Now, when you think kingdom of God as a place, which it is a place still, but when you see it just simply as a place like the gold streets, the mansions, and the, and the clouds, and the flying angels... Well, you fail to understand that the kingdom of God is also very much a being, meaning the kingdom of God and God are one and the same in the sense that God is the kingdom. He is God, right? And so when I see that phrase, 
they won't see death until they see the kingdom of God. The natural progression actually goes into verse today's passage in verse 28, where it's a transfiguration. We see Jesus in all of his glory. The kingdom of God is being fully just being shown through this glorified version of Jesus in the sense that his, his clothes become sparkling white. Um, two people, uh, Moses and Elijah show up and just like, it's just glorious, right? Uh, let me see what he's, they said that his clothes were dazzling white and his appearance and face were altered. So you see Jesus in his full glory. And when you see Jesus transform, that is the kingdom of God fully being manifested through the king. And Peter, James, and John are now the ones that saw that. They saw that. They saw the glory of God. They saw the glory of Jesus in that was clothed in human form, but is now in this very moment being blasted to them. And so much so that Peter makes a statement that even says he doesn't know what he was talking about, but he was just saying things. And he was so overwhelmed that he says a bunch of gibberish and nonsense. But what's very interesting is that Moses and Elijah were standing next to Jesus. Now, these two figures are very important figures in the Old Testament in Israelite history. Moses is by far one of the greatest leaders that Israel has ever had. And when you look at Elijah, he, Elijah was one of the greatest prophets that Israel has had. So when you look at the combination of Moses and Elijah, Moses represents the law, the commandments of God. Why? Because the Ten Commandments were first given to Moses, in which Moses then gives it to everyone else. Elijah is one of known as known one of the greatest prophets in Israelite history. And so what you have in Moses and Elijah is you have the law and you have the prophets both standing together looking at Jesus, talking to Jesus, talking about how he's going to depart from this world, pretty much die for the world. And what you see is that Moses and Elijah represent the whole Old Testament. They're the representatives. And the law and the prophets, their hope was always to a coming Messiah. And so when you see Moses and Elijah show, Elijah show up, you see that Jesus is the hope of the Old Testament made reality. You can say it again. The hope of the Old Testament, the hope of humanity is found in the being named Jesus Christ. And so, as they were leaving, Peter, not knowing what to say, said something very foolish. Hey, you know what? I'll make you guys three tents. We can chill out like this forever. You know, some translation says tabernacle, uh, which can translate to altars. Because Peter is a faithful Jew, and he knows about Moses. He knows about Elijah. And he's able to recognize them. I don't know how, but he's able to recognize them. And he's saying, hey, let me build you guys. Let's stay, let's stay in this moment. Because this is the thing. That moment of Jesus being transfigured was a beautiful, outstanding, glorious moment. And Peter wanted to stay in that moment. And I get it. You always want to stay in those moments that are just glorious and you want to relive it time and time again. Why do we always go back to our old stories? Why do we go back to old videos? Why do we go back to old movies? It's because there's something glorious about those things that we want to relive constantly over and over again, especially if you're going through a tough time. But this is the thing. Jesus, says, God was like, and Jesus was like, what are you doing? As great as this moment is, if you just live in this moment only, you'll never be ready for what's to come. And so they said a cloud came over and just completely startled everyone. And then a voice comes out. This is the second time God the Father speaks because the first time was at the baptism. The second time is here. It says, this is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. So what God the Father is saying is, this Jesus is the chosen one. There's not going to be another Messiah. There's not going to be a different version. This is it. So therefore, listen to him. And so when you look at today's passage, you ask yourself as a Christian, what do we do with this? Um, there's like little things that you could do application-wise, but what's the, what's the big thing? And I think the big thing here for us um, is that we realize who Jesus is. That he's the chosen one. 
there's never going to be another Messiah. And you may think, of course, that's what we've been taught in Sunday school. But the reality is, often in our lives, we're always looking for a Messiah in things or people of this world. We're looking to other things to save us, relieve us, give us breath, give us rest, give us peace, give us security. But there's only one chosen being that can do all those things and that deserves the glory and worship and attention from us. That's Jesus. And so when we look at this yesterday and today's passage, it's pretty much talking about, do we know who Jesus really is? Because if we do, we realize that then all of our hope and faith need to be in Him and only Him. And secondly, um, that there's this reverence for Him, this love and awe and just worship of Him. Peter wanted to dwell with the three, Moses, Elijah, and Jesus. God the Father tells him, man, indirectly, there's only Jesus that you need to be worried about right now. As great as Moses and Elijah was, they pale in comparison to Jesus Christ. Notice how out of the three, only Jesus was transfigured, meaning only he was emitting this crazy light and glory. Why? Because as great as Moses is, as great as Elijah is, they're nothing compared to Jesus. And that's the same thing with any spiritual leader. We have great spiritual leaders throughout history and even to this day, but they will always pale in comparison to Jesus. And therefore, there's always those songs about casting our crowns, laying our crowns down, because that comes from the book of Revelation where the elders in heaven, despite their glory and splendor before God, they lay their crowns down. Because as glorious as we become, nothing will compare to the glory of God. And so, um, one thing that we can do today is this. Do we have this reverence and love and understanding of who He is? Because if, it, if we do, it will really transform in the way we choose to live our lives. I'm not saying life is easy and decisions are easy but it will definitely change the way we approach life. Not for ourselves, not for our breakthrough, but for the kingdom to break through. All right? Um, be blessed. It is actually really cold in New Jersey right now. Um, so hopefully you're staying warm. And may you always realize how blessed you are. So be blessed.